In this lesson we're going to be taking a look at the other form of vector multiplication that I've referred to in previous lessons. And this new, this new form is called the cross product. In a previous lesson, actually in a couple of previous lessons, we took a look at dot product and that was a vector multiplication where the result was always a scalar. In this case, the cross product is a vector product where the result is also a vector. We've already talked about the cross product, although we didn't call it that, when we talked about the right-hand rule. We first introduced the idea of the right-hand rule to help us describe a um, perpendicular orthogonal right-handed system, which is the x, y, z set of coordinate axes. Essentially, that's R3. So in describing R3, we said it was perpendicular, and we used this word orthogonal, which means it's right angles between everything. And then we also said it was a right-handed system. And the way I described it is I said you start with your index finger along the x-axis, your middle finger along the y-axis, and then your, your thumb, the result, will be your thumb along the z-axis. And that works in any order. So if we come over here, if I take the i vector as my, my starting vector and then my j vector as my second vector, so index finger, middle finger, I, my thumb would be pointing up. But I can actually do this a couple of other ways as well. I could start with my index finger pointing along j, my middle finger along k, and then I would end up with my thumb pointing in the i direction. And if I went from k to i, my thumb would point in the j. So this cyclic nature actually applies to the right-hand rule in terms of these basis vectors. There's actually, uh, the vector operation itself can be applied to these, and it allows us to take the relationship between i, j, and k and put it into an algebraic form. So here I've written out what are known as the cross products for all of the basis vectors. So the one we started with, which was the relationship between the x-axis and the y-axis to give us the z-axis, is the i-vector crossed with the j-vector yields the k-vector. Now an interesting result of this is if we go in the opposite direction, it's not necessarily the wrong direction, but it's not going to give us a right-handed system. If I go from the j-vector to the i-vector, the result there would actually be the negative k vector. And so you can see all of these cross products have the positive result comes from, if we, if we wrote out the vectors i, j, k, i, j, k, and if I just kept writing it that way, so long as I'm going in this order, the results of my cross product will be positive. So if I go from i to j, I get positive k. If I go from j to k, I get positive i. If I go from k to i, I get positive j, etc. If, on the other hand, I were to reverse the order, if I go from k to j, I get negative i. k cross j gives me negative i. If I go from j to i, I get negative k. If I go from i to k, I get negative j. i cross k gives me negative j. So if you can remember just that i, j, k, i, j, k, or x, y, z, x, y, z, just keeping those in order, if you follow those from left to right, you always get positive results as you take steps. If you go from right to left, you always get negative results. And of course, all of this assumes steps of one. We're going to make use of this little shortcut or this little trick to remember this a little bit later. So keep that in mind as you move forward here. Now, in general, we're going to want to define the cross product. We're not always going to be interested in doing the cross product for the basis vectors. That's actually not very interesting at all. We're going to actually want to be able to take the cross product between two generic vectors, which I've represented here. The vector A, which has an X component, a Y component, and a Z component and the vector b, which has an x component, a y component, and a z component. The result of the cross product, a cross b, that's how we would say that, a cross b, 
the result of the cross product is actually this fairly complicated looking vector and this is a vector it's in component form so here is the x component here is the you know rather than writing x i think i'll write i'll put the i vector here is the y component which would be corresponding to the j vector and here is the z component which would correspond to the k vector and even looking at these in detail i've got the y component a's y component and b's z component minus a's z component and b's y component keeping all of these things straight can actually get quite complicated the only simple part at least in my view is that you can see i've got y and z here so in the x component i only have y and z components in the y component i only have z and x components so you can see in the x component i'm actually in the overall x result let's call it in my x result i'm actually missing x components from the original vectors in my overall y result i'm missing y components and in my overall z result i'm missing z components but the ordering of these is not obvious or not intuitive but i'm going to make use of this little trick that I talked about to give you a way to be able to do this a little bit more easily. But first of all, I'm just starting with this definition of A cross B. Now I want to give you a bit of an idea of where that comes from, but I don't want to overwhelm you with it. If you're interested, you can fill in some of the steps here. In my experience, it's actually much easier if we start with the basis form version of these vectors. So I've got an x, y, and z component, which means the x component times the i vector, the y component times the j vector, and the z component times the k vector. And similarly, I have that for vector b. If I take the cross product, then I end up with this whole vector crossed with this whole vector. Now, you're going to have to take a leap of faith with me here, because I'm not deriving this rigorously. So you're just going to have to trust me that the rule for distributing or expanding brackets actually applies here for cross product. And so if you can take that on faith, then if I were to expand this out, for example, if I'm going to expand out this x component of the a vector times the i vector, that would get multiplied into bx times the i vector, by times the j vector, and bz times the k vector. And I would have to do this distribution across all of them. So as you can see, each one of these produces three of these arrows. So I'd end up with nine terms, and I'd have to simplify them. And when I do simplify them, I end up here. And, and you can actually show this in combination with those results that I had before. For example, that i cross j is equal to the k vector, where j cross i, on the other hand, is equal to the negative k vector. And that explains where some of these are positive and some of these are negative. That's where that comes from. Now, that doesn't really help us with keeping these straight, which one is which. So I think what I'll do is right here is where I'm going to show you that little shortcut. And then we're going to apply it in an example. So let's focus on these vectors and we can just focus on the component form that's okay so what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually make a little bit of a table here so I'm going to write my i j and k vectors or I could write x y and z that would be fine and so then I'm going to take my first vector so I'm doing a cross b the order matters here so I'm going to take my a vector which has an a x a y and a z and I'm going to take my b vector which has a bx by and bz now I'm going to take the unusual step of I'm going to take this column and I'm going to write it again so I'm going to write the i vector again I'm going to write a x component and the b x component and now this is where the Remember, I talked to you about just making sure you keep these in order, i, j, k, i, j, k. 
So all I did is I took the front and I wrapped it around onto the end. Now here's where the actual visual part of cross product comes into the algebra. Here I have the two vectors i and j. So what kind of component will i and j give me? Those are going to give me a k component. i cross j gives me k. And what are the coefficients of it? So that's this one right here. So what are the coefficients of this? I start in the top left corner and I multiply ax times by. And this one is a positive ax times by, ax times by. And then I start in the top right corner and I multiply ay times bx. There's ay times bx. But this one is negative. And then I would do the same thing here. Let's switch colors. My positive. And so this one is going to be j cross k. So this is going to give me an i vector. So that's over here. a y b z. There's a y b z and it's positive. And then I go the other direction. Negative a z b y. And that gives me that component. And then I would finish things off. Do I have another color I can use? I guess I could use black. Then I end up with, so this is going to be my j vector because that's k cross i. And then I get positive azbx, positive azbx, minus axbz, minus axbz. So that's how we can make use of that idea. And you can see we, we are doing a bunch of cross products here, if you like to think of it that way. Okay, so although I've included the formal definition of cross product here, I don't actually want to make use of that. If I can remember it, I would much rather make use of that shortcut technique. So the reason I say find both possible cross products is because I can find u cross v or v cross u. So let's start off with u cross v, but I'm actually going to go to my answer fairly quickly here, but the way I'm going to accomplish that is I'm going to use that shortcut technique. So I'm going to write the i vector, the j vector, the k vector. So the i component of u is going to be 2, 1, and then 4 for that vector. And then for v is 1, 5, and 6. You have to do this in the order. So u cross v. So this is u and this is v. And then I'm going to take this first column and I'm going to rewrite it over here. 2 and 1. And then I perform my cross product. So I end up with my first cross is going to be 2 times 5 minus 1 times 1. And I'll go ahead and write that one out. So 2 times 5 is 10 minus 1 times 1 is 1. And then which component is that going to be part of? i cross j, that's going to give me k. So you can see if I do this blindly, I'm going to end up with, I'm going to have to do some rearranging. So we'll, we'll do an even better version of this in the next example. Plus, and then my next bracket is going to be 6, 1 times 6 is 6 minus 4 times 5 is 20, so 6 minus 20 is negative 14, and that one is j cross k, which gives me an i component, plus, and then my last one, 4 times 1 minus 2 times 6, so that's 4 minus 12, 4 minus 12 is negative 8, and then k cross i gives me my j component. And so I end up with, let's just simplify this, I ended up with 9k minus 14i minus 8j, but we don't normally write things this way, we would normally write this as negative 14i minus 8j plus 9k. And there we have our answer, and that of course we could have written that answer in component form negative 14, negative 8, positive 9. So that is one way that we could have done this. 
Now another way that we can do it, I'm going to try to do it a slightly more efficient way, and now I'm going to do v cross u. So once again, I'm going to write out my, let's extend that page, I'm going to write, this time it's going to be the v vector comes first and the u vector comes second. I'm going to write out the i, j, and k, but then I'm also going to put an extra i on the end there. So now it's going to be the v comes first, so that's going to be 1, 5, 6, and then I repeat the 1. The u is going to be 2, 1, 4, and then I repeat the 2. And now what I'm going to suggest is if you want to make this a little bit more efficient, you want to keep track of, well normally we write this as i, j, k. So why don't we find which one's going to produce the i? Well, j cross k is the one that's going to produce the i. So why don't I go ahead and start there? So 5 times 4, let's go back to blue since I'm going to write that over here. 5 times 4 is 20, minus 6 times 1. So we have 20 minus 6 is equal to 14, and that's in the i direction. And the next thing we want is my j direction. Well, my j direction comes from k cross i. That's going to give me my j. So now I get 6 times 2 is 12, minus 1 times 4. 12 minus 4 is 8, so that's going to be positive 8j. And then finally, i and j give me my k vector. So I get 1 times 1, minus 5 times 2, 1 minus 10 is equal to negative 9 and that's my k vector and I could also write that as 14 8 and negative 9 and as you may have noticed u cross v and v cross u they actually are the same but opposite vectors so they have the same magnitude but opposite directions and that's actually consistent with what we looked at before when we looked at for example, i cross j is equal to k, but j cross i is equal to negative k. They're the same magnitude, but they're opposite directions. Okay, now some of the algebraic properties that go with cross product. This one is the most important one because this is the one you're most likely to run into and we just looked at this actually being the case. When you change the order of a cross product, it's, it's not commutative. When you change the order, you introduce a negative. It's the opposite direction. The distributive rule works, and I told you that we took that on faith. I'm not going to prove this one, but we used that before when I showed you how the cross product would be laid out algebraically. And scalar multiplication, it works the same as most in most cases, scalar multiplication works this way. It does like this for dot product as well. So I can take that scalar and I can apply it to the a vector, uh, or I could apply it to the b vector, or I could take the cross product and then apply the scalar to the, the answer vector that I got from there. Now here, I'm being asked to find a vector that is perpendicular to both a and b. But that's the very definition of, of cross product. If I take A cross B and say that's going to give me the vector C, then we know the vector C is perpendicular to A and the vector C is perpendicular to B. That's the very definition of a cross product. And when you think about this, why is this the case? I want you to go back to thinking of our i, j, and k vectors. So there's the i vector, there's the j vector, and there's the k vector. And the whole point of this is that this is an orthogonal or perpendicular right-handed system. So i cross j gives k. It's perpendicular to both of them. So all we need to do to answer this, to find a vector perpendicular to both, is just take the cross product. And either cross product will do a cross B or B cross A is perpendicular.
So A cross B or B cross A is perpendicular to both of them. So how do we do that? So let's go ahead and do A cross B. And we will do our A cross B using our shortcut. So I've used my space to the side there. I'll just go down here. So I'll write my vector A, my vector B, my I, J, K, and I'll repeat my I. My vector A has a 4, negative 3, negative 7, and I repeat the 4. My vector, sorry, uh, yeah, my vector B has a 2, negative 1, 5, and then I repeat the 2. And now let's go ahead and let's do our I component first, which comes from the JK vectors. So it's going to be this multiplication. Negative 3 times 5 is negative 15. And you might even, you can do this down below here. Um, so in this case, I get negative 15. And then I've got negative 7 times negative 1 is positive 7. So that's going to be, I'm subtracting that. Remember, this is plus and this is minus. So I've got negative 15 subtract 7. So I end up with negative 22 times the i vector. And now my j vector is coming from k and i and so I end up with negative 14 minus 20 that one's easy enough to do negative 34 j and then I finish up with this which is negative 4 and don't forget this is minus negative 6 so that's the same as negative 4 plus 6 and so we end up with plus 2 k and so that ends up giving me my vector that is perpendicular to both of them. So there's my, or there's one of my two possible answers for this one. And a final thing to consider about cross product, and this has to do with the, the definition of cross product. As you can see, cross product actually has a definition very similar to the dot product when we're but you have to remember that this definition applies to the magnitude of the cross product because magnitude a magnitude b sine theta can't give us direction we would have to figure out the direction um, using the right hand rule or other algebraic methods an interesting result of this is we've seen many times where we have made vectors by adding two uh, sorry we've made parallelograms by adding two vectors together so it turns out you can find the area of this parallelogram using the cross product and the reason for that has to do with the relationship between in this case the vector b the vector b forms the hypotenuse of this small triangle and so that means the height of this triangle is actually the length of this red side which is the magnitude of B times the, this is the opposite side. So the relationship is sine theta. If you wanted to use the pure triangle version of this, you would actually start with this. You would say sine theta is equal to opposite over hypotenuse, which is the height H over the magnitude of B. But then when I cross multiply that, I end up with this expression that the height H is equal to magnitude B sine theta. The base of this triangle is simply, or triangle, the base of this parallelogram is simply magnitude A. And the area of a parallelogram is equal to the base times the height. It's actually the same formula that you would use for the area of a rectangle, because that's all a parallelogram is. It's just a rectangle that's been where the sides have been tilted by an equal amount. So the base of this rectangle is the magnitude of A. The height of this rectangle is, or the height of this parallelogram is magnitude of B sine theta. And that is equal to the magnitude of A cross B. And that's it for this lesson. You can see I've got some assigned questions that actually span across a couple of sections in the textbook. 
I believe that's just because some of these are making use of this parallelogram uh, area of a parallelogram idea and so we might as well start making use of that now um, we're going to be looking at this section separately in the the next lesson also